Let's talk about the box model. This will make understanding many of the properties in CSS much easier. Each element can be thought of as having its own box, and understanding these boxes is key to being able to create layouts with CSS or to align items with other items. In this lesson, we will take a proper look at the CSS box model so that you can build more complex layout tasks with an understanding of how it works and the terminology that relates to it. The CSS box model is used to create a definition for the way that HTML elements are organized on the screen. This approach accounts for options such as margin, padding, borders, and all the properties that manipulate them. Let's take a look. The element content, or text node, is the center of the box. The best part of the present, if you will. This is the main HTML content that you are wanting to display on the site. This can range from text, an image, buttons, just about anything. While it's quite direct in definition, it should be noted that content can also be empty space as well. You may find an instance where you need to create an empty element to be used as a creative component within your website. The padding section of the CSS box model sits in the space between the HTML content and the border. Padding provides space around the element. Think of sending something fragile to someone. You wouldn't just toss it in a box. You would wrap it in bubble wrap and take up that extra space. In essence, you would pad the element. The thicker the bubble wrap, the more padding you have around that particular item. As with many of the other items in the box mode, the padding can be altered through its related properties, and we'll look at that in just a moment. The next layer is the border. This simply wraps the element. A border can wrap immediately around the element, or it may look further away from the element if more padding has been applied to the element. This area exists as a boundary between the margin and the padding properties of the box. This area can be manipulated using the CS border property for styling and sizing needs. And finally, we have the margins. These are on the outside. Think of the margins that you use on a piece of paper. These margins give space away from the edge of the paper. In HTML, margins work the same way in giving space away from the edge of the page or other elements. You can consider this a buffer area that separates the interior of the CSS box model from the other HTML elements on the page. Let's jump into our editor and put the box model to work on various elements. Here's the page we're starting with. It is a very simple page. There's a section with an H1, an H3, and two paragraphs. It is worth noting that the second paragraph contains a span tag. In regards to the CSS, all I have is a rule on the body, setting the background color, and the font family. Now, in order for you to visually see the boxes on the page, I am going to use the Universal Selector. The Universal Selector will allow me to select every single thing on my page. The selector for the Universal Selector is the asterisk, and when we do this, in essence, we will be selecting every single item that is on our page, everything that is a descendant of the body. So all I'm gonna do here is I'm just going to turn my border on, and if we refresh the page, you'll see that I now have a green border around every element. We can visually see the box that encompasses each of our elements. Now it is worth noting that many of our elements are separated with spacing between the subsequent elements, and between each other. This is because by default, the browser has some margin applied to these elements. So let's take a look at this so you can visually see what's happening. In order to visualize this, I'm going to open up my developer tools. You can access your developer tools by going to these three dots, going to more tools, and selecting developer tools. Or if you just right click on your page, you can click inspect and this will also open the developer tools. Now, we'll be talking more about the developer tools a little bit later on, but for now, I'm just going to give a little bit more visual space to my HTML page, and over here on the right, we can see the developer tools. This top section shows me the HTML, 
So I can actually really look in and select all of these elements. When I hover over the various elements, you can see that some of the elements will have different colors that appear. So when I'm hovered over my H1, the text node appears as blue, and then the space around the heading is visually appearing as orange. That's actually the margin. Let me give a little bit more space to this bottom section. If you look at the bottom portion of the style tab, you will see a diagram. This is going to show you the box model. In the inside, we have the actual element, and right now I'm on the body element. Let's go ahead and let's select our H1. So I'm clicking on the H1 to lock in this as a selection. In the style tab, it will tell me any styles that are being applied to this element. The styles that appear on the top of this list are the ones that have more specificity. Right now, the border, which we created in our CSS, is the topmost item. And you can see here's the selector, here's where it's located in my style.css on line six, and here are the property and values. There are some italic selectors and property values. These are associated with the user agent style sheet. This is the browser's styling of this particular element. We've mentioned how the browser applies some styling to elements by default. It sets the font size of text. It might put margin and or padding around elements. These are the styles that are being created by the browser. If we look at the bottom part, it's going to show us the box model. So this will show me the actual size of this element. Right now my element is 361 by 28. That's the element itself. Then it shows me the padding, which would be green. This particular element has no padding, so it has no value. Then we see the border. The border that we defined is one pixel, so it's showing as one all the way around the box. And then we have the margin. The margin on this particular element is set to almost 20 pixels, just under. The unit of measurement that's being used by the browser is the M unit of measurement. This is a relative unit of measurement, and we'll talk about this in a later video. For right now, though, I want you to be aware of the various parts of the box that are showing. We'll leave this window open, and as we make changes to these elements, we can look in the developer tools and really start to dissect what is happening on our page. Let's go ahead and let's make a rule on our section element. I'm going to select section, and the section element is the wrapper element that wraps around all of my page content that I have on my page so far. This is contained inside of the body, and you can see the body element has some margin applied to it. On the section element, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create some padding. So we're gonna specify padding, and we'll just make padding of 15 pixels. If I save my page and I refresh, you're now going to see that all of the children elements of the section appear more indented. And if we hover over the section, you can see that there's a green highlight that appears. This represents the padding. If we look in the diagram, it shows us that there's 15 pixels of padding that appear all the way around this section element. So like I said before, the padding appears on the inside of the box. If I was to go ahead and add margin to the section. If we refresh the page, you're going to see I have some more spacing, and if we hover over the section, you'll see here's the border of my section element. Right now, there is now spacing between the section's border and the body element. That spacing is the margin. We placed 10 pixels of margin on our section. Then we have the one pixel border then on the inside of the box, we have the 15 pixel padding. If you want to be able to control the spacing between elements, let's say I want my heading and my subhead to be close to each other. Currently, the heading has margin on the top and the bottom, and so does the subheading. The margin on the subheading is slightly less. Let's remove the spacing on the H1. I'm going to come to the H1, and I'm gonna set margin bottom, and I'm gonna set this to zero. Up here, 
I'm using shorthand notation. When I only put one value in for margin or padding, it applies that value to all four sides of the box. When I specify a specific side of the box, like margin dash bottom, I am only affecting that part of that element. So if we refresh, you'll see that there isn't really much change. So what's happening? If we come to our heading element and we look down here in the rendered area, you can see that my H1 element doesn't have margin on the bottom anymore, but there is still space between the heading and the subhead. The reason that there's space is because the subhead still has margin on the top. So we need to remove that if we want to shrink up the spacing between these. So I'll go ahead and I'll make a rule for H3. We're going to say margin top and set that to zero. Remember when you use a unit of measurement that is zero, you don't have to put pixels or M's or anything like that. Zero is just always zero. If we refresh now, you can see how the heading and the subhead snug up to each other. We have eliminated the margin, that outside spacing, between these two elements. So now we've collapsed the margin. Now before we move on, if I change the margin on both of these elements to 10 pixels, it would make sense that the margin would be spacing of 20 pixels between the H1 and the H3. But if we refresh and we actually look, you can see here is the margin top on my H3. It's 10 pixels. Here is the margin bottom on the H1. It's also 10 pixels. Instead of adding a 20 pixel of separation, when you have elements that contain margin and they sit right next to each other, we have something called the margin collapse. Instead of adding both of those margins together, the margins will merge together and whichever margin is the largest is going to win out. So instead of creating 20 pixels of spacing, we only have 10 pixels of spacing. This is called the double margin collapse. And what it means is that since these both have margins, the margins meet each other and then whichever one is less collapses. In this case, they're the same. So one collapses. In essence, they're sitting right on top of each other. So you do need to be aware of that particular nuance when you are styling your pages because it can be confusing if you look at the math and then it's not appearing the way you would anticipate it to appear. The next thing I want to look at is I want to look at my inline element. So all of these elements are block elements except for our span element. This is an inline element. As you can see, the inline element is taking on the border property that we defined on everything. So it has the border property. Let's select our span element and let's give it a background color so that we can easily see it. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add padding to this element. I'm going to add padding of 10 pixels. When we refresh on the page, you can see some wonky things have happened to my page. What's happening here is the inline element is taking on the properties of the padding all the way around, but it is breaking out of its parent element, breaking out of the paragraph. When it comes to margins and paddings, the browsers treat inline elements differently from the block level elements. You can easily add space to the left and the right of inline elements, but sometimes you won't be able to add height or margin or padding on the top and the bottom of the inline element. For instance, if I change padding here to margin and we save the page and we refresh, remember now the spacing is on the outside of the box. You can see that when I hover over the span element, I only see the margin on the right and the left. The inline elements will not allow for margin on the top and the bottom. And that is because of the fact that they are inline. Now padding is slightly differently. When we add padding, it will affect most inline elements, but it does break out of the parent element. So 
it works a little bit differently. There are ways that we can rein this in, control it, which we will be talking about in the future, but I just wanted to point this out. In addition to the padding and the margin, other box model properties are width and height. So if I come back to the H1 element and we add a width of 50% and then I add a height of 150 pixels and we save, you will see that my H1 heading now is taking up half of the available space. I made this a percent, so if I resize my browser window, the width of that H1 is going to grow and or shrink. The height is a fixed value, so it made the height 150 pixels. If we hover over the element, you will see that there is a little overlay that appears and the overlay is telling me what the current width of the element is, in this case 161 pixels, and what the current height of the element is, in this case 152. It is worth mentioning that because of the box model, the height has increased by 2 pixels. I defined a height of 150 pixels, but my height is 152. The extra two pixels is coming from the border of one pixel on the top and the bottom. So what we actually have is 1 plus 150 plus 1, which gives us 152. If we were to add some padding to this element, and I'll just add padding of 10 pixels, you will see that now we have some spacing on all edges of our box, and it pushes the text node away from the border. We're padding the inside of the box. If you check the width and the height of the element, you can see that they've increased by 20 pixels. So now we need to add the height of the element, which in this case is 150, plus the two pixels of border, one for the top and one for the bottom, plus 20 pixels of padding, 10 for the top and 10 for the bottom. And ultimately, this will affect the height of the element. This is the default rendering method of elements in HTML. This can lead to confusion when you are creating more complex layouts and you're trying to mathematically figure out how large something should be. So we can override this default behavior by adding a property called box sizing. And if we set this to border box and save our page, when we refresh, you're going to see that that H1 shrunk a little bit. And if I now hover over the H1, you can see that the height value is 150. When we add a box sizing of border box, the values of padding and border are subtracted from the overall height. So instead of adding to the height like we saw before, now the height is going to remain fixed and whatever the padding and border are going to be, they will just force the content to take up less space. It'll take a little while to get used to working with the padding and margin and seeing how they affect your elements, but this is a great way that you can affect or control the spacing of elements within your web pages. The developer tools are going to be very helpful because they will allow you to visualize where the padding and margin exist within the various elements. I hope this offered some clarification as to how the box model works. We'll keep talking about this throughout our course.